Good to see the visitors here. My mom is here, so give her a hug and tell her you love her, because I sure do. Um, I'm excited about this lesson. I hope that it's a blessing, and this lesson right here is going to lead into another lesson. How about that? Actually, it's gonna. It's there's actually three parts to this lesson. Uh, and next week we'll deal with one of the uh, parts and then the following week we'll deal, Lord willing, with the next part of it. But I kind of want to set it up this morning and then get into it. And we've been building uh, on it all through as we've started this second Thessalonians uh, book, looking at these different things that these brethren were good at. Their faith was growing and their love towards each other was abounding. But one of Paul's primary concerns with this second letter was the problem of the suffering of the Christians. These brethren, by holding on to their faith in the Lord, were being persecuted. And Paul, as he continues his letter, wants to commend them and remind them that what they were doing was not in vain. Let's read verses four, five, six, and seven this morning. It says, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest when rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And I'm going to keep reading verse eight in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The suffering that they were dealing with so patiently and so faithfully was proof that they were set apart people. But as we all know, suffering is a key attack point that Satan uses to tempt us to give up. Am I right about it? When target, when we are targeted by wicked people, because of who we serve, it is only natural for us to want to give up on our faith. In the first century, followers of Jesus were being persecuted and had to face a culture that hated them. I want you to listen to something from 195 AD. Tertullian said this, what are we to think of the fact that most people so blindly knock their heads against the hatred of the Christian name so that when they bear favorable testimony to anyone, they mingle with it abuse of the name he bears. Now, this is the example. Someone would say, Gaius Seuss, he is a good man, only he's a Christian. Think about that. He's a good man, but he's a Christian. What do we get nowadays? Oh, you're a Christian? <laughs> Tertullian in 213 AD said this, pagans assemble and they have their own circus where they readily join in the cry, death to the third race. You know who the third race was? Christians. And in 210 AD he said this, every crowd in the popular assemblies is still shouting to throw the Christians to the lions. Have you ever been handcuffed? Have you ever been put in a cell and hear chants from outside? Throw the Christians to the lions. 
Following Jesus is something that requires full faith in him. Amen? See, the reason Paul was bragging about the faith that he saw growing and the love that he saw abounding with these brethren was because he knew something. See, he knew that without those qualities, without the right faith in the right leader, without the right love that was abounding towards the brethren that had that same like-minded faith, they wouldn't be able to withstand the suffering that a Christian would have to face. Now, I want you to hear me this morning. I want you to listen to me this morning. See, they could bear these things with patience. You want to know why? Because they weren't alone. But remember what the Lord said to the disciples in Matthew chapter 24 when he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Listen to what he says in verse 9. He says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and they will kill you. And I want you to remember this from our master. He says, and you will be hated by all nations for." My name's sake. Paul tells the young preacher Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12. He says, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Persecution and tribulations were a promise from our Lord and carried on by the teachings of the apostles to Christians in the first century and for us today, brethren. But when we think about our lives, how blessed are we? I appreciate Tim's prayer in talking to this, talking about this concept. How blessed are we to live in a place where we can freely worship the Lord free from harm? toward us. Shouldn't we be thankful? Shouldn't we be thankful to the Lord that he provided this for us? Because he is the one who provided it. Amen. The Lord is the one who provided this for us. And in turn, shouldn't it cause us to give our life to him? And serve him with everything that we got? With enthusiasm? With pride? With joy? You know, this weekend is dedicated in remembering the ones who have fought and served for our country and gave their lives so we could live free and to worship how we want to. And I so appreciate all those who have served in the military forces. I appreciate you so much. And I appreciate what you gave up for me and for so many others. But let's think about it. Will that always be the case here? Will we always be free to do what we want to as far as worship goes? We don't know, do we? But are we, let me take this to another level. But are we as children of God ready, no matter what the situation is, to stand up for what we believe in and the one who we love and the one who we follow, no matter what, no matter what comes our way. Who do we love? Who do we follow? Ask yourself that question. Is it our savior? Is it our Lord? Is it our King? Is it Jesus? Is it the one that Martha spoke of in John chapter 11, verse 27, when she said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. Do we believe that, brethren? Do we believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he's the son of God, the one who came into this world to change it for us? 
Clement of Alexandria in 195 AD said this, and I want you to think about it. You want to talk about people who are speaking from time past, Christians who were in the face of lions, Christians who were in the face of persecution like we've never seen. Listen to this. They persecute us not from the supposition that we are wrongdoers. They don't get on to us because they think that we're wrongdoers. But imagining that by the very fact of our being Christians, we sin against life. You're a Christian? That's terrible. This is because... Of the way that we conduct ourselves. Brethren, are we the called out people or are we not? Do we conduct ourselves in a different way? Are we the royal priesthood? Are we the ecclesia? Are we the called out people? See, these people were being persecuted for being those types of people. And it says, and because we exhort others to adopt a similar life. Isn't that what Jesus started a long time ago? Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I want to show you a way to go. I want to show you a way to live. That's way better than you ever imagined. I want to hear, I want you to hear me this morning. Tertullian in 197 AD, he said this, if a Christian is pointed at, he glories in it. How about us, brethren? If dragged to trial, he doesn't resist. How about us, brethren? If accused, he makes no defense. How about us, brethren? When questioned, he confesses. How about us, brethren? And when condemned, this is my favorite one. When a Christian is condemned, you know what he does? He rejoices. Again, I want to ask, do we have an excuse to not follow the Lord with everything that we got? How blessed are we? Who do we love? Who do we follow? In 195 AD, here's another one. Some indeed think it is a mark of insanity when it is in our, our power to offer sacrifice at once and go away unharmed. Now think about what he's saying. Now think about this, brethren. Just, just, just follow me for one, just few minutes. Some people think that we're crazy because we can actually offer up the sacrifice to another God and we can go away unharmed. But then in quotations, it says, holding as, as ever our convictions, we prefer, and I had to look this up and I love it, obstinate persistence. Refusing to change your mind. He says, instead of just going and offering this sacrifice and just walking away, I'm persistently refusing to do that because I would rather confess the Lord as the Savior than to have safety. Really? Really? With our hands thus stretched out and up to God, rend us your iron claws. You ever been touched by an iron claw? You remember those traps that people set up out in the wild, man, and things catch a bear or some type of animal? Those things are terrible. This man says, rend us your iron claws, hang us up on crosses, wrap us in flames. Take our heads from us with the sword. Let loose the wild beast on us. And then he says this, the very attitude of a Christian praying is one of preparation for all punishment. 
Really? How blessed are we, brethren? Huh? How far should this gospel go to the world? In Acts chapter 8, there was persecution among the church, and you know what it did? It thrived. Iron claws, crosses, fire. It wouldn't stop them. What's stopping us? The mall? What's stopping us? Why would anyone want to endure such hostile times and face such harsh punishments? Why live a life knowing that you may be harmed or killed just confessing that you're a Christian and admitting that Jesus Christ is the Lord? You ever thought about that? When we think about these times and we think about these situations, the overwhelming evidence, if you just look at it and see it, is this. Either everything that I've just said, all of these things that I've read, what we've read in 2 Thessalonians is either all a lie or it's truth. And we as followers of Jesus Christ, if it is true, have some promises coming to us. And if we endure, this is what we will receive. The promises to give us relief. But what are they? The first one is, and we're going to look at it in depth next week. It's the righteous judgment of God. Look at what the Bible says in verse 5. It says, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Those things that were happening, those persecutions that they were facing were manifest. They were tokens to let them know God is watching and God loves you. And God is not letting these things go by his face without taking account. Verse six says, since it is righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. In verse seven, it says, and to give you who are troubled rest. What are those promises? It's the righteous judgment of God. And the second thing is rest. Now I want to close with this thought. And I want you to really think about it this morning. Either Christianity is true or it's false. If you say that it's true and you believe in God and you obey him, then if it really is true, you've gained God, you've gained heaven and everything else. Amen. That's what I'm longing for. How about you? I'm longing for the day where I can be with the Savior. If it's false, I've lost nothing. But I've had a good life, marked by peace, and this illusion that ultimately everything makes sense, right? I've lost nothing. Except I've been good to people, I've had a peaceful life, I've done what Jesus has commanded me to do, and if I'm false, then if I'm not right, then I really haven't lost anything. But if you say that Christianity is not true and it's false, well, you've lost nothing as well. But if you say that it is false and it turns out to be true, you've lost everything. And you get to spend eternity 
in a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That sounds like a terrible place. Weeping. Where the fire is never quenched. I remember lighting that fire out behind my house and that thing erupted on me. And it was hot. And it burned my arm. And it hurt. This place, the fire is never quenched. It never lowers in intensity. It stays the same. I don't want you to go there, friend. You get to spend eternity in a place where there's weeping and there's gnashing of teeth. A place where the fire is never quenched and you will be separated from the Lord forever. Why were these men and why were these women in the early stages of Christianity willing to suffer persecution? Why were they willing to be ridiculed? Why were they willing to be mocked? Why were they willing to be made fun of and even killed? Why is that? You want to know why? Because they knew that following the Lord makes all the difference in the world. Am I right about it? You want me to prove it to you? Here's what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. Brethren, let me ask you something. Do you hear the voice of Jesus? Do you hear what he tells you to do in his word? Do you listen to what he tells you? Do you follow him? See, when you do that, look at what Jesus promised you. He says, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. And then he says this, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. They're mine. You're mine forever. Don't you want to be in that family? Don't you want to be a part of that family? Situation, Friend, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I plead with you. I beg you. As Christ were pleading through me, Jesus was on the cross and he was dying. He lived a perfect life and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Why would he say that? There's a great day coming. Whether we want to admit it or not, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we will all... Be judged on our deeds, whether good or whether bad. And boy, I'm going to be so thankful that I got Jesus on my side. How about you? Friend, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Brother or sister, you, if you're here struggling today, please make it right. Repent of your sins. Turn from that way of living and turn towards God. That repentance that leads to salvation. But if you're not here and you're, you're not a Christian, make it right today. Wash your sins away by obeying the gospel, believing who Jesus is, believing that he came to this earth, that he died and that he rose again. You do it by repenting of your sins, as I just talked about, turning from your way and turning towards God. Confessing that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Being baptized in water for the forgiveness of your sins and then live that life faithful. And he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. If you need to obey the gospel, if you need to become a Christian, hey, be bold and understand this. The world will not always like you because Jesus says, They'll hate you for my name's sake. But is our faith strong enough in him to stand the test of time? Only you can answer that. Whatever it is, come right now. As together we stand and sing.